I now have the honour of introducing our next panel um, to discuss what I perceive as one of the most critical areas in women's health and one that's long been ignored despite the horrific consequences of doing so. In this session, we're turning to the urgency behind policy reform for First Nations women's health and the importance of placing an Indigenous lens on women's health at work, including, the, including heeding the expertise and advice from First Nations health professionals. For this conversation, I'm joined by Tanya Hervenen, a proud Aboriginal woman and registered clinical psychologist with a master's in clinical psychology. Tanya is currently working as the wellbeing director with Abistar. Uh, Donna Murray is a proud Wiradjuri and Wanarua woman and the chief executive officer of Indigenous Allied Health Australia. And also Linda Burney, who I believe may be joining us in just a moment. We're just having some slight technical difficulties. Um, but Linda is the member for Barton. She's the Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services um, and the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians. She was also the first Aboriginal woman to serve in the House of Representatives. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, Tanya and, and Donna. It's it's lovely to to have you um, in this discussion. I want to um, first look to to a question around um, the impacts on of COVID on Indigenous Australians and particularly on Indigenous women. Um, how have Indigenous women been uniquely impacted by the pandemic? Um, Donna, I might I might go to you first, if that's all right. Thank you. Um, well, we know for Indigenous Allied Health Australia, we we actually did a COVID nineteen survey with our members, um, and uh, eighty four percent of those were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women uh, in the workforce. And the data that came back from that survey was, was sort of what we anticipated, but it was about that feeling of isolation and that sense of belonging. Um, and particularly where they were working from home or the uncertainty within the workplace and dealing with, with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There was also that loss of feeling of connectedness and relationships and belonging. There was definitely the feeling of an increase in workload and responsibility, yeah, and that was not just delivering the health service but around education to our communities and our families around COVID. Um, there were also continuing financial challenges so uh, while the workload was increasing, um, our pay rates don't increase um, and that's also a concern when you've got others that you need to care for in your home and extended family. Um, and there was also a concern around the significant need to change the way people were working um, and the impact of COVID on, on the close interaction and relationships with clients and patients and that was then changing. So you know, the, that, that unknown of what, what now, how do we support our communities and our families uh, in a different way? So they were really clearly um, articulated in that survey within our, within our workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as though, I mean, some of those st statistics and, and what you've cited there is, is really, you know, confronting, mm -hmm. but do you feel that um, it was addressed enough um, at the time, you know, as we're going through, were we looking at that? Were policymakers looking at the way to to mitigate the, the fallout there? No, I, I don't think so. And I don't think we were ready. Yeah, I don't think governments took um, the concerns from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and the health service seriously. Uh, I think that we were very lucky in the first stages of the waves that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people weren't as affected. But this third wave has, you know, absolutely exposed uh, the lack of policy preparedness by governments to act um, in a co-design way, listen to communities, listen to the workforce about what was needed. And so, you know, the ongoing concern and stress too for our workforce, which is primarily female, uh, is their potential risk to getting COVID, close contacts of being COVID, which takes the workforce away from the services mm -hmm. and then provides more stress for, for themselves and community because there's no access then uh, mm -hmm. in addressing um, vaccinations or even COVID itself. So, we, we're, uh, yeah, we, we, the governments, I don't think, were prepared at all or listened mm -hmm. carefully to everything, other people's concerns. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, yeah. I mean, I think that last point is a, an important one around actually listening. Um, and, you know, I think if the last 18 months has shown us anything, it, it is that we haven't brought enough um, First Nations voices and consultation yeah. into the mix. Um, Tanya, why is it why is it critical to place um, an Indigenous lens on, on workplace wellbeing and why has this been sidelined by many employers and by policymakers? Yeah, look, I, I don't think workplace wellbeing is something new. I think it's been around for some time. I think it's morphed from workplace health and safety. And I'm sorry, my camera... I can't. I don't think you can see me. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think it's been around, but it's becoming more relevant now. Um, in regards to mental health and well-being, before pre-pandemic, we've had you know limited resources and I guess limited ways of working in a culturally safe way um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people before the pandemic. And now I guess my concern is um, post-pandemic and, and in saying that I know that the Northern Territory are going through their battles right now and my thoughts and, and care and love um, for the communities in um, the Northern, Northern Territory area right now. Um, so we're going to dust ourselves off and see what, what the impacts are mental health-wise and wellbeing-wise post-pandemic. And, um, and I'm going, I feel that we're going to see some of the issues we had before pre-pandemic like we don't we don't have all the resources um there aren't all the answers and again when I say resources I mean the, the qualified staff that work in culturally safe ways and mm -hmm. um the policies that match what's what does really good workplace well-being look like so post-pandemic we're probably going to be seeing the same and so your question was why is it so important it, it is important yeah. because there needs to be Aboriginal ways of working with people to, to to help people recover or heal or live mm. their best lives that they need to live. And, and for that, you do need um, culturally appropriate services and, and a culturally appropriate workforce, which is um, Donna Murray's forte. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but yeah, I having, having these really beautifully qualified Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health professionals uh, are, are definitely um, key to that. Yeah, yeah. So how is that achieved? You know, I think that efforts in this space to date have been tokenistic, but how do we make that a meaningful step and, and um, to bring in that, that consultation and make sure that those culturally appropriate and relevant um, spaces are created? I think acknowledging that we haven't gotten it right now or mm -hmm. whatever we might be doing or we might be doing some beautiful things already but just seeing what we what what where we are right now um so I don't know if it might take an audit or an acknowledgement of where we might be and and then um and then like you know again there's a um not only a financial benefit to making sure that you get this right, but also like for all of Australia, to be honest, um, I don't have the data on hand, but, um, you know, if you're looking after workplace well-being and, you know, if you're looking after well-being in the workplace, there's so many benefits to that, not only for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and the Arche sector, but definitely for the rest of Australia. Um, so, yeah, acknowledging that, but also then having the tools and the resources and knowing what to do to, to make things okay within the workplace. And then, um, and then championing that, like implementing that, not having a document or a policy sitting on a, a bookshelf or, mm -hmm. or in a, or on the website, like actually having that fully implemented within the organization and then, and then, um, evaluate it as it goes, like what's working, what's not working, what can we share with the sectors? Um, and, and mm -hmm. I think. I, to be honest, Aboriginal health and well-being, pretty, I feel like my from my perspective, really good at sharing resources when we need to, um, because mm. we all want to make sure everyone's okay. Um, but you know, continuing to do that if things work well. Mm. Yeah, Donna, I want to talk to you about some of the the unique disadvantages that First Nations women face in in healthcare. What what are the the kind of biggest barriers um, at the moment? Oh, well, well, I think there's a few. Um, <clears throat> it's always about access. So access to appropriate services and specialist services. So if you take um, breast cancer rates as an example, 
Um, you know, the, the data will show us in 2018 that only 37% of Indigenous women aged between 50 and 69, which is my age group, um, participated in the breast screening program compared to 54% of non-Indigenous. But yet we're more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer. So access to services is critical, to specialist services, but also making sure that it's culturally safe and responsive, making sure we have access to communication and um, educational resources that are, are appropriate, you know, for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and our um, cultural diversity and our communities. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, you know, and, and the more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are in the workforce, the more, you know, we can ensure that they come with a cultural lens, that they understand our lived experiences, they understand our community and our cultural load that we also bring as Indigenous mm. women. Um, so I think, you know, we've got a long way to go with building our own workforce and that's got to be from a local community perspective and pathways locally um, because that's where the sustainable workforce is. We, we know how to care for our people. We know how to care for our family. Um, but the systems often don't support the flexibility and accessibility uh, for us. Uh, so that, that's, a, you know, a key disadvantage, I think, in some of our communities. Mm. Um, we're often not heard or listened to. Um, we're often not part of the decision-making of those particular, how do we develop those services and programs to meet our cultural determinants as as um, First Nations women, I think, is really critical as well. Um, and, and we're in a system that's sort of a design for a one size fits all, you know, in a mainstream mm -hmm. sector, which doesn't include, uh, you know, our centrality of culture or our our roles and responsibilities. Um, yeah. that we come with, which is why the, the Aboriginal community control sector was born, really, wasn't it? And from great women, can I say, great mm -hmm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. And, um, you know, and, and we're continuing to build on that, but we need investment in having a voice, being heard, uh, and even the new uh, women's report from the Social Justice Health Commissioner at the moment, uh, June Oscar, is a significant document that we can all learn from. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tanya, I want to touch on the the notion of of kind of a holistic approach to healthcare, which you know, I guess Donna alluded to a little bit in that, um, you know, that's that's the disparity at the moment in the healthcare sector is that there is this kind of one size fits all um, mentality from from you know where policymakers and funding is coming from um, when you know your your understanding and, and um, Indigenous healthcare is, is so holistic. How do we bring that um, in as well and, and how do we kind of place a lens on, on that approach? Again, I think similarly to what Donna was saying, just um, listening to what we already know. So we've got um, 60,000 years of um, wisdom and experience around what holistic um, health looks like and Again, we call it social emotional well-being. So social emotional well-being um, encompassing um, all of those connections that Donna alluded to before, um, culturally, spiritually, land, um, community, family, even to yourself. And again, um, just knowing that there are other knowledge systems and that there are other knowledge systems that work well for our people, and acknowledging them and, and listening and listening to them um, as part of that. So. Um, social emotional well-being is not new. Um, mm. it, um, it looks at um, collectively even like the individual, the family, the community and society as a whole. So and there's another thing we say is actually mainstream Australia could learn a lot from that as well, from those mm. types of holistic approaches to, to, to well-being. Mm. Um, mm. A, a concrete, um, succinct um, biomedical model is really important. However, there are other ways um, for healing and recovery um, that we mm. need to take stock of. And look, there are some, um, there are several um, spaces in Australia that actually acknowledge that and that's happening and working very, very well. So it's about, would you say merging the two? I'm not too sure about that. I think it depends on the community, but it's also about understanding that there are other knowledge systems that work well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just want to um, interrupt the session a little bit uh, because Linda has now come in. Um, so 
I am very pleased to um, introduce Linda into the session as well. Um, Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm very to see you. Linda, good. I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, technology will be the death of us. I think that is everyone's mantra for the last two years. Um, so, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have just had a, a, a bit of a discussion already around, um, you know, the impact of, on women's health, um, Indigenous women's health throughout the pandemic and, and some of the um, policy areas that we need to look at. Um, but Linda, I do want to bring you in there and, and look at, at some of the, the select policies that you feel um, are really imperative at the moment and the government can implement to better protect um, and support First Nations women's health. Um, hi, Tanya and Donna and Tala. I'm sorry I'm so late. Um, and of course, we do all the protocols of recognising country and so forth. I'm in downtown, very wet Marrickville at the moment, so in Gadigal country. Um, look, I'm sorry I haven't followed what you've all been talking about, but you sound like you very much uh, know exactly your area. Clearly, I work in a political frame and... One of the things that I have done, as a, particularly as an Aboriginal woman, is be very careful never to take the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio um, until just recently when I felt like I had the maturity and the standing within the community to take on that responsibility because the expectations are through the roof and just not realistic. Uh, and the reason I've done that as an Aboriginal woman is, and I've held some very senior positions, but always in mainstream positions, if I can put it like that, taking on portfolios that are not specifically Aboriginal. Um, and I've done that basically to say to people, do not pigeonhole us. And mm. I think that's really important when we think about the employment area and policies that somehow or rather, if you're Aboriginal, the only thing you know is Aboriginal affairs, the only thing you can talk about are Aboriginal health or Aboriginal employment mm. or Aboriginal education, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, particularly uh, when you have a look at the breadth of our experiences, First Nations women. So the first thing I'd say is get your head out of the clouds and understand that Aboriginal women have very strong views on childcare, on unionism, on the environment, on cost of living and all of those things. So it's important for people watching us today to understand that um, my experience is, uh, is incredibly broad and my identity and who I am is my Aboriginality. And that brings a lens to all the other things. Mm. To answer your question directly, Talia, I have come to the view that we can have all the best, best DV policies in the world. We can have all the best child protection policies in the world. We can have all the best health policies in the world. But if you don't have the fundamental building block of decent housing, then the rest is a waste of money. So, um, and it's important for people living in cities, and I say this from a policy perspective, and I'll stop here, to understand there is another world in this country, and that world is poverty. It is 20 people living in a three-bedroom home. It is the lack of capacity to turn on and tap and get clean water. Um, and it is impossible to stay safe and healthy in an environment where the living conditions are intolerable. Mm. So I think if there is one policy area that needs to be focused on that affects every other policy, things that Donna and Tanya have been talking about, I'm sure, it has to be adequate housing where you can 
keep your food safe and mm. you can cook a meal and you can, you know, you can send your children to school healthy mm. and prepared. And that's not the experience for so mm, yeah. many of our people. So I would say in terms of women employment and health and outcomes, there has to be adequate housing because at the end of the day, the pressure with inadequate housing comes on women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we know what the, the homelessness rate is um, for, for women in this country and that's felt more acutely by First Nations women. Um, is that a policy area that Labor will focus on at the next election, Linda? Yeah, so we have um, a, commit, a major commitment in terms of uh, housing, uh, 4,000 houses will be provided for women escaping and families escaping domestic violence. And, of course, a huge proportion of that are our women. Um, there's a component for veterans and there is a large component, I think 20,000 units for social housing. And there, there is, at the moment, $200 million set aside out of that to for repairs and maintenance, but that's not going to even touch the sides. And I think this pandemic has just shown how important housing is for mm -hmm. isolation, for safety and all of the other things. So mm -hmm. we're working on, at the moment, a specific component for First Nations housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Donna, I want to um, ask you about employment rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and how specifically we can boost um, employment yeah. rates uh, yeah. and because I, I think, you know, some of the statistics around that are still really confronting um, yeah. in, in community and personal services workers, 24% um, are Indigenous and 21% and, uh, in, in clerical and administration um, workers. But um, I think, you know, we that's probably one of the areas that, that really needs to be addressed. Uh, how, mm. does, how does that happen? Mm. I mean, the health and social system sector is one of the biggest employers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we, we do tend to go to caring roles. Um, and, you know, one of the health workforce that, that does have a, a good number is, is nursing and midwifery. It's not a parity in any shape or form. But, you know, they're, they're, we've got to look at and those things that, that Linda just talked about are really critical in our communities because you've got to have a safe place to live to be able to learn to be able to engage in your education, to be able to have aspirations, you know, and think about your goals and where you're going as a young woman. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, when I was young, that that wasn't always easy. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of options available and we weren't encouraged either to um, enter the workforce. So uh, for us at, at Indigenous Allied Health Australia, we're really focusing on those pathways aspirational thinking, leadership thinking, goal setting, um, social emotional well-being embedded in that pathway of care. And we're developing localised um, health academies for our young people and primarily 90% of those students are our young women mm. who are really looking at look, entering into the health workforce. They're not quite sure what that might look like, um, but when they talk to people like Tanya and other uh, role models and mentors, they, you know, they can really say, yeah, that's what I want to be. That's, that's what I can see myself doing. And supporting that pathway through year 11 and 12. To, to actually getting our year 12 attrition rates uh, higher, mm. increasing our completion, that feeling of confidence and success that you can be anything you want to be um, are, is that that positive thinking that we're really looking at at the local level with young women and supporting that journey. But along the way, there are those social determinants that we also mm. have to address, transport, housing, you know, um, 
clothing um, to attend your your um, clinical placement, you know, your employment experience. But also for us then linking not just educate, not completion of education, but linking to directly employment opportunities in their local communities, mm. in the health mm. and social assistance sector, whether that's uh, at the hospital, whether that's at our Aboriginal medical services, our disability providers, aged care providers, um, but recognising the caring roles that also our young women have is really important. And that's not often recognised. They're often carers in their mm. families while trying to attain their education and also working part-time. So those mm. cultural open responsibilities, uh, we also have to take into consideration along the way. Um, and, you know, experiencing domestic violence myself uh, as a single parent for many years, you know, th those daily struggles... Um, make it really difficult to to think about well what do I want to do you know mm. and what are my aspirations so you know we're really trying to provide a program that stimulates mm. that thinking and success and achievement and that's mm. our IHA National Health Academy program. Yeah yeah I think so much of what you've just mentioned there goes back to Georgie's point around stru structural reform and mm. doing things in a meaningful way um, rather than in a tokenistic uh, way, which we've which we've just seen too much of. And um, I think the only sorry, the only other point I didn't mention is that making sure that we're addressing the cultural determinants. So what makes us strong? What enable us to, mm. to be to be good in our well being and and confident is our culture, our identity, our relationships, our families, and our communities. Um, and and honouring and recognising the value of that, I think, is what we have to do better. Uh, for our First Nations women um, into employment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tanya, I just wanted to talk to you quickly about um, the notion of decolonisation in the workplace, which you've spent a lot of time on um, and, and written about extensively. Can you shed a little bit more light on, on that topic? Yeah, so I think it's pretty much what we've been saying. Um, so Linda and, and Donna are looking at the power imbalances and about sharing the, the voice for Aboriginal people. Um, it does talk about inequity um, and sharing power and resources so that, um, I don't know, that there's not just one area of knowledge, that there are many areas of knowledge that we talked about earlier, but, but, but acknowledging that and being able to give space to that. Um, so it's, it probably takes a process of unlearning. <laughs> there will be a process of unlearning and then learning that, um, yeah, it's, it, it is a power imbalance and also on whose terms. Yeah. So even if I'm sitting on a board as the only Aboriginal representative, like what terms, what are the terms of reference for that? Like I think Linda mm -hmm. was talking about earlier that we do have um, knowledge in many spheres and many areas, um, not looking at one person as being the voice for all. Mm -hmm. um, having one person on a board is not diversity. Mm -hmm. So, again, um, looking at um, ways, and I think we, when we did look at decolonisation, we looked at it like where the term came from, what does it mean for us as Aboriginal people, what does it mean internationally? So we're still working in that space and, and having those connections internationally because this is um, quite common for um, countries that have been colonised. Yeah. Um, um, this notion and it's about now this has happened how do we regain that power and how how can we equally sit at the table and have that yeah. voice yeah um, so yeah. for work systems for workplace though um, it's about um, having really clear policies um, and instructions and ways if there is racism you know racism does exist what what can we do about it how do we look at retention? How do we look at supporting staff? Donna talked about the, the extra or added layers of responsibilities for young Aboriginal women. So how do we support that? Um, I guess the other thing is um, when there's, um, there's um, I guess when there's conflict in the workplace, how can we manage that? You know, some people feel uncomfortable talking out um, about certain things because there is no process or when people do speak out about something, they're villainised or vilified for it. So what are there? What is, what is there? Um, what, are, what are those things in place that are um, for people to be able to work as well as they can? Because people that work, they're members of the community. Um, yeah. We're not separated from community. When we go to work, we're still members of the community and providing to a family. Um, so how do we make sure that, that works for women in the workplace? Yeah. 
Do you feel that that's something that employers, I mean, many employers mm. have quite comprehensive diversity and inclusion policies in place and, um, you know, they, they posit to kind of walk the talk when it comes to these things. But uh, I think, you know, that that point you just raised about um, token efforts on DNI panels and, and um, you know, bringing, um, you know, a singular voice into the mix on, a, on, a, on issues is um something that, you know, I imagine you face so often. I mean, I face it even as a um, woman from a culturally diverse background. I, I feel like, you know, sometimes there are um, things that I'm brought into just to be that that voice. So um, how do employers get that right? I'm not too sure. That might be a bigger question. I might defer to Donna and Linda, but I will say sometimes it does take to sit at the table and be that one voice for change to happen too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's a big, bigger discussion to have um, as an individual, but also with your, your, your elders or with the people that you talk to to make those decisions. But sometimes you may have to take that seat at the table for things to be different. Um, but mm -hmm. I would like to defer to Donna and Linda. Yeah, Linda, I might, I might throw that one to you as well. How, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, well, I think Tanya um, has really hit the nail on the head. It, uh, it, it seems to me, and I meet with so many companies that Tanya's referring to that are developing their RAP plan. I have their, their diversity plan and Sometimes I think, is this a ticker box exercise for you? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I'm sure in some cases it is and I'm sure in some cases it isn't. But it's, you know, I'm much older than all of you and I'll be 65 next April. And I remember very clearly as a younger person being the only Aboriginal person in the room at the board table and very often being the only woman. So, of course, you were much better prepared than all the blokes and you read all the papers and um, so forth. And it's <laughs> disappointing to hear that that's still, still, still the case. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... Um, one of the great things in my mm. life is that very often my expertise as an educator was sought, not as an Aboriginal educator. And I think that, um, that you have to understand what are the levers that you've got to bring about change. And I'm sure Tanya and Donna have many more levers than I have. But one of the levers that I have if there's a change of government, um, <laughs> which we will know pretty soon, um, is the um, APS, the, the who's in, you know, the federal government employees. So we've set a 5% target. I know a lot of people reject targets and affirmative action programs. I don't because they bring about change. So I've set a 5% target of Aboriginal people through the APS. Now, that's not revolutionary, but I tell you what is, is making sure that those people are not entry level or trainees, that they actually populate the senior executive middle management yeah. into a secretary's employment contract that person is responsible for growing the Aboriginal workforce and making sure Aboriginal people are at senior levels. That's one way you can bring about change. And the other is what Tanya and Donna are both speaking about, and that is saying to our young women, our young men as well, don't be limited by what you see behind you. Be aspirational in what you do because you are as good as anyone else. And it comes, I think it's what Donna was saying, it comes to people's belief in themselves, strengthen their culture and their Aboriginality. 
but understanding that you can be an engineer and an Aboriginal person. You can be an architect. You can be a politician. You can be a policymaker. And giving people what Aboriginal people do, um, as Donna and Tanya would know, is that to look around and say, well, if she can do it, why can't I? Mm-hmm. So you need those those people out in front. Yeah. I think that is an excellent um, note to, to wrap this conversation up on. And I want to thank you all for sharing your insights and your expertise on the topic today. Um, it's obviously not something that can be solved in one conversation, but it is these conversations that we need to have um, to start to start getting things right. Um, and we need to focus a huge amount of our effort on reconciliation and leaning on the wisdom of First Nations wisdom, um, women's wisdom. Um, this needs to be comprehensive, um, ongoing and meaningful. It can't be tokenistic anymore. Um, thank you so much, Linda, Donna and Tanya. Uh, and I can't wait to, to hear so much more from all of you. Thank, thank you. you.